Hello, everyone. GM, GM. Welcome back to another episode of Overpriced JPEGs. We have a very special guest with us today, the one and only Cooper Turley, better known as Koopa Troopa on social media, Twitter. You probably know him. He's like everywhere. He's an angel investor in music NFTs, an advisor to projects like Audius. He was a co-founder of Friends with Benefits, FWB. He's a partner at Variant and just like a man about town. I feel like that expression has an actual meaning, but to me, you're a man about town because you're everywhere on Twitter, at conferences, just such an OG in the space. Cooper, so happy to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. And I'm so excited. Music NFTs is something I've wanted to dive more into for a while. And you are just like the expert on experts on this. And so like, I really want to break it down. I want to take this in bite-sized chunks and really explain to people the the broad ecosystem happening here as best as possible. But before we dive into all that and hopefully make it really clear for folks, we do need to hear a word from our lovely sponsors. It's increasingly obvious that everything will become tokenized and NFT marketplaces needs robust financial reporting, performance analysis, and the peace of mind that they are compliance ready. Gilded's NFT Ops is a one-stop financial reporting solution for growing NFT platforms. Gilded has developed marketplace-specific modules to track the financial performance of NFT creators, including revenue tracking, collection metrics, royalty payments, and revenue share. Customers of NFT Ops gain full access to accounting tools and powerful APIs for custom integrations that simplify operations, streamline reporting, and produce tax-ready data. So no wonder why so many top brands like CoinMarketCap, Gitcoin, Nifties, and Poap trust Gilded to automate to make complex reporting workflows. Visit gilded.finance slash bankless to learn more. If you're starting on your NFT journey, you need MetaMask. This is your tool to unlock the world of DeFi and NFTs without giving up custody over your private keys. MetaMask is both a secure in-browser wallet and also a secure bridge for your hardware wallet so that you can connect to any Web3 enabled website. You can now trade tokens with any DEX or aggregator. MetaMask Swap gathers real-time pricing information across the DeFi exchange ecosystem, allowing you to select your best price while getting all of the MetaMask benefits of self-custody, lower gas costs, and increase transaction success rates. MetaMask also has a fantastic mobile wallet, which I use while I'm out and about. And I use it to collect PO apps, NFTs, and use it for all my DeFi things while I'm away from home. If you haven't downloaded MetaMask, you gotta try it out. Download MetaMask for desktop and mobile at metamask.io, or load up your Ledger, Trezor, Keystone, or Lattice hardware wallets so that they too can get into Web3. All right, I wanna break this down and I wanna keep this as clear to people as possible. And as I was preparing for this interview, one thing that really stood out to me is I feel like we use music NFTs or like it's sort of this catch-all term, but there's really a lot going on under the hood here that we want to be clear about. So on the one side, I feel like we have music NFTs, collectibles, and we'll maybe break down a little bit more what that means. And then on the other side, we, we have the use of, call it smart contracts, to fix the ways that the music industry is systemically broken. And these are not nece- these are these are two different categories. Would you agree with that categorization and then maybe we'll go a little deeper on 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 each of these categories? Yeah, I would say in its current form today they are very different. I think ultimately it'll become one and the same and all payments, streaming, collectibles will all exist natively on chain. But for right now we kind of have this paired system where there's new assets that are being tokenized in web3. And then we have other companies looking to bring off-chain assets into Web3. And so some examples of that would be a company like Royal, which is tokenizing the royalties from Spotify and putting those into NFTs versus something like Sound, which is a digital collectible that exists entirely on-chain and has no tie into sort of anything happening off-platform. Royal is an interesting example because it feels like it crosses both of these categories. And, and I'll explain what I mean there. So for example, we're, we're, if we start with this music NFT piece, and I want you to really break this down for us you mentioned this, Royal sells music NFTs, but the the music NFTs that Royal is selling come with some rights over the master, right? Over the recorded works. So that you're entitled to a certain level of royalty as the owner of the NFT moving forward, which is helping to fix a systemic problem. The the other one you just mentioned there, sound, is it sound XYZ? What did you mean? Yeah. That's purely, that's not necessarily quote unquote, fixing the systemic problem. I'm sure you could argue the other ways, but that's truly just, hey, here's an, audio soundbite backed by a, a smart contract. Is, is that right? Yeah. Collecting a tokenized version of a song. Okay. 
tokenized version of a song. Does this mean the same thing as what it means in like the visual art world? Does this mean that basically there's a smart contract that points to an audio file that's stored on IPFS? The exact same thing. We had CDs, vinyls, eight tapes, and now we have NFTs. Why do you think the collectible music world hasn't taken off the same way the collectible art NFT world has? I think it's a very different mindset to be able to understand what's happening. Music requires time to listen versus art, which you can instinctively just look at for a second. But if we ask the question of time, I mean, Super started in 2018, and there was a very long period of time where people were not taking collectible art very seriously. It was more of a hobbyist item. I think that's kind of the current phase that we're in with music right now, where it's a very hobbyist market. But over time, you start to see things like PFPs. And once there becomes that mainstream moment, you know, the primitive takes off. But I think there have been underlying foundations that have been around for many years prior to these viral moments that we see with collectible art today. And for these tokenized songs and, and music, do they tend to come with a visual component as well? Like are, are music artists partnering with visual artists or creating a visual component? Or like, what is it? Break that down for folks who have never collected or seen a music NFT or tokenized piece of music. Yeah, I love that you asked this question because this was really the big shift that started, quote unquote, music NFTs in my book. You know, there was a heyday in Nifty Gateway where every big DJ was partnering with the giant visual artist to do a 15 second audiovisual clip that had some 3D animation on it with a little music snippet underneath. And it was cool. You know, musicians were getting into NFTs. But I would argue that that wasn't music NFTs because there was not really a focus on the song itself. It was more about the audiovisual pairing. And so what we see now is that most, quote unquote, music NFTs are a full song, what's called a three minute MP3 or WAV file, and then a cover art. And while you can go to OpenSea and see the cover art, what you're collecting is the song, not necessarily cover art itself, but obviously the cover art adds to sort of the overall output, but at its core, you are collecting the music and not necessarily the cover art or the visual associated with it. What do you think, is there a real world analog to this? Like there's obviously a real world analog to visual NFTs in the sense that like people hang paintings in their house and that's how they signal that they're rich and can own a Picasso or like whatever. But when I think about how people have shown off music in the past, where my head goes, and maybe I'm wrong about this, is like, again, hanging the vinyl cover art there or the CD that you can physically see. Why are you convinced that this will actually happen, that uh, music NFTs will will work? I'll give you three different analogs. The first one is playlist. I think we can all wrap our heads around that one. We find songs that we like and we put them into a collection of sounds and we share them with our friends to say that we like a certain type of music. I think that's the easiest way to think about it. For the more super fan relationships, vinyl is exactly accurate. If I really resonate with a record, if I really resonate with an artist, I'm going to go above and beyond to collect a rare edition of that that signals that I love that song more so than just adding it to my playlist. The last one, which is a little bit more obscure, but really what got me over the edge with music NFTs is hat pins. And so in electronic music culture, there are these artist projects where you would have a limited number of amenal vinyl hat pins that you could put on your hat or you could hang on a poster or keep on like a pin board in your house. And for me in college, I was super into this culture. Um, and artists like Pretty Lights would drop a run of 100 hat pins and people would rush to the show to get them. They would be for sale for $20 at the show. And then on the secondary market in Facebook, they'd be selling for $50, $60, dollars And so during my time in college, I got really into collecting hat pins. I had thousands of dollars of them. I was selling them all the time. And so I got to see firsthand that there is a collectible market for music and specifically for super fandom. But I don't think we've ever had the ability to collect songs. We've always just collected the association with an artist. And so what I think that we're seeing with music NFTs today is taking that same mentality of trading hat pins, but instead doing that with tokenized records in a fully automated, always on secondary marketplace. Sticking with this theme of how the the collectible part of the market is playing out, and then we'll spend a lot of time talking about the, the systemic fixes and, and super fandom and how that can be monetized in different ways. I think you are super well-spoken on that. And Audius is doing interesting things there. On this collectible front, though, uh, you, you were mentioning to me that generative music and, and generative collectibles are really taking off on the music side of things, too. Of course, we've seen this again on the call it visual art side. Talk to me about what's happening in, in that scene. So the same way that you open a pack of Pokemon cards, we're now seeing different projects explore what it looks like to open a pack of songs. There's a project called Song Camp that's doing a mint today for a headless brand called Chaos. And so this is 77 artists brand? that came together. A headless brand, yeah. So it's 77 <laughs> artists that came together to make one artist project. Mm, so the artist project is mm. called Chaos. There's 45 different songs that represent 20,000 different NFTs. And so when you go to the site to mint, you're basically opening a pack of cards and you don't really know what songs you're going to get. But there's sort of this game to be played now around collecting the rarest songs in the pack, you know, the rarest songs in the series, filling out the grid. And this sort of sets the precedent for a larger movement around generative music. So in the same way that we have art blocks, let's call it Chromio, Squiggles, Fidenzas, Ringers, whatever it might be, 
there's platforms like Beat Foundry and Soundmint that are doing curated drops with artists, where an artist will come to the table with a certain number of stems. They'll basically run it through an algorithm and then output all these unique audiovisual combinations that represent a generative music NFT. And I think the important thing to recognize there is that beyond collecting a single that's coming out on Spotify on Friday on New Music Friday, there's also a new world of creation that's happening on chain that I think is very native to the space. And across the board, we're seeing this very interesting experiment where artists are really challenging the fabric of what does it look like to output music that's not just a 30 second clip for TikTok. And for collectors such as myself, I think that that novelty kind of gives the space a little bit of an edge up over just collecting the songs that we already know and love. That's so interesting. Let me ask, because what this feel like it feels like it lends itself to really easily is sampling and and getting like stems of songs that you can then incorporate into your own music, which again gets us to a little bit the utility, the fixing systemic music problems and licensing. And is that a component of this? Did you just spell that out and I missed it because you I was Im- imbibing a lot? Yeah, I think it's a huge component of it. I believe that very soon there will be a day when people are making music with every underlying stem having a tokenized component to it. Let's call it 100 collectible versions of a kick drum. If I put that in my song and then I sell that song on Sound XYZ, a percentage of those proceeds will come back to me as the producer of that stem because it all lives natively on chain. I think that on chain attribution for music is going to be absolutely gigantic. So, this is more than just a collectible. This generative art movement is not just like, hey, here's a collectible version of Shake It Off, which is my favorite song, or whatever, right? You can tell I'm not in the indie scene. I just mentioned a Taylor Swift song, it's the first thing that came to mind. Um, so, th- this is like the, the generative art piece. There's a lot of not just, hey, here's a collectible thing that I can show off. It's a, hey, I could incorporate this as a producer, you know, in my mixing of a song. In a very utopian world, you know, I think where DeFi did it really well is composability was key and fundamental to a lot of the success of the industry. There was five protocols building on top of one another and it all just worked flawlessly under the hood. You didn't have to think about it. I think for music right now, there's a lot of different players and a lot of different parts of the table. And if we can create better systems for on-chain attribution where we're less reliant on humans sitting at desks in Los Angeles and more reliant on smart contracts operating on Ethereum, then I think that we're going to get to a really special place with music and help to unlock a lot more value for the space as a whole. Mm. I got to shout out my friend, Bart Decrum, who I, I worked with as early as like August of last summer, who was trying to do this. He does like some electronic music stuff. And he was like, music NFTs. And he released his own music NFTs that like were, I think had a generative component. And anyways, I know you listen to this Bart, so I'm, I'm shouting you out for, for having introduced this concept to me very early. Um, anything else you want to talk about on this, let's call it more purely collectible side Fan clubs, the way that we're seeing fan clubs shift or change with the advent of NFTs before we move on to some of the bigger systemic fix stuff. Absolutely. I want to just highlight that collecting music is not that deep. I think with a lot of crypto and Web3 primitives, we try and act like we are creating this brand new fundamental technology. It's all these new primitives. It's kind of all this new exciting stuff that has never been done before. But we've purchased CDs for a long time. We've bought vinyls for a long time. A lot of us have bought songs on iTunes for for a very long time. This is no different than that. Music NFTs are simply just selling music online. And I think when you take a step back and you look at that, there's no reason why every single song on the planet should not have a collectible version associated with it. I think people are starting to recognize that it's not subtractive from the traditional rollout process. If I'm releasing a song on Spotify, it's better that I have a collectible version because the two work in tandem with one another. And so to really just highlight that front and center, um, I believe that collectible music has value solely because it exists. I don't think that you need to have utility on it for it to have quote unquote value. But once you can start from the framework of recognizing that collecting a song is valuable, you can then start to layer on different primitives like utility and like ownership that make these things be more forward and more representative of, I think, the ecosystem that we've all come to know and love. Do you have any numbers out of curiosity of like what the market of diehard music fans are that collect music paraphernalia, that do things where they're collecting music to show off that they're a fan? It's very difficult to quantify because it varies relative to the artist projects. You know, some of the um, some of the the artist projects I would represent here would be like BTS, um, you know, in the electronic music scene, fan clubs like Elenium, Grizz, Pretty Lights, like I mentioned before. The jam band scene is really, really into this. So bands like STS9, Lotus, Disco, Bislets, et cetera. And I think for a lot of these different fan communities, people recognize that their identity is highly attached to the artist projects that they're following. And so instead of it just being me going passively listening to a song on Spotify, I can speak from personal experience. You know, I was traveling the country, going to see these bands. I was going to local meetups all the time. And if we think about the way that DAOs are operating in Web3 today, my very first relationship with quote unquote DAOs was through music communities. And so I think adding in Web3 native assets to represent ownership in these communities is a huge opportunity and the exact reason why I'm so passionate about it. 
Oh, is there pushback within the it sounds like it's a lot of the alternative music community and that's what you're describing. The way that we see pushback in the gaming community against NFTs, is there pushback in like the music community around music NFTs? Absolutely. I would say most major artists that have tried to do NFTs will receive some form of backlash from their fan base by talking about doing it. Um, specifically on the Nifty Gateway wave, there was a couple electronic acts that got really big pushback from their fan base. But the interesting thing to highlight here is that most of that pushback came from Instagram. And so the fans that follow artists on Twitter are very different from the fans that follow artists on Instagram. And so I think a lot of that pushback came from an artist posting on Instagram that they were doing NFTs. And so we sort of saw this drop off about a year and a half ago where many artists became disenfranchised because they thought they were going to get crucified by their fan base. And so when I'm working with artists now, I tell them to stick to Twitter, you know, recognize that it's for a very small segment of your community. Don't try and sell to all of your fans because most of your fans can't even buy it in the first place if they wanted to. And instead focus on that 1% super fan community that you have been fostering for years and try and figure out a way to get them involved because there are people out there that want to collect these assets, but it is currently not for all of your fans. It's actually for a very specific demographic that's willing to jump through some hoops. What is the evolution of music NFTs been and this I think gets us to then I again royal audience and these the problems with the music industry and how we fix them like did it did this start with tokenized music or did it start with we want to fix the system it's a little bit of both you know my relationship with um, music and web3 in general started from fixing the system as a whole so I went to school for music business and I was told about smart contracts being able to expedite the royalty system and so to quickly give an anecdote here if I stream your track on Spotify today you are not going to see that payment for about three to six months. It's going to go through a bunch of different systems and eventually over time, it's going to trickle down and come back to one of your sites that you can go and press a button to collect from. But when I heard about smart contracts as a way to be able to say, hey, I'm streaming your track right now. Here's one cent and it's going to go directly to your wallet. That instantly clicked and made sense to me. And so my early relationship with music and Web3 was through platforms like Audius that really highlighted that problem very viscerally and said, hey, what if we made a more transparent system for on-chain payments, for artist to fan relationships, for data collection, um, fan clubs, as you mentioned. And over time, that sort of grew into tokenized collectible music. And so I would say, quote unquote, music NFTs really started around the days that catalogs started producing records. And so there were artists that were tokenizing songs on Zora. Zora then ended up becoming catalog because catalog is built on top of Zora. And we saw this wave of sort of one of one collectibles that very, very much represented the early days of Super Air. From there, we started to notice that people were branching out and doing additions. You saw platforms like Sound XYZ come about, um, Mint Songs, a couple others that I could name. But instead of it just being a one of one collectible with only one fan collecting, we started to see people tokenizing 10, 25, 100, 1,000 records. I think that's when these things became a little bit bigger. And since then, we've now seen kind of a wider wave around generative music and sort of bigger drops in the form of platforms like Beat Foundry, Soundmint, and now more recently, a lot of the bigger artists and music NFTs are building their own drop sites and products. And so if I am an artist that's sold a couple one of ones on Catalog, I've sold a couple drops out on Sound XYZ, maybe I've done a Beat Foundry drop, but I have an album coming up, you know, they're teaming up with developers and basically making a site so you can mint a thousand, five thousand collectible versions of your album and have this really big, you know, come to come to Jesus moment with the release of your record that's saying like, hey, if you want to be a part of this from day one, here's the earliest way to listen to the music and have a collectible version of it so that you can kind of participate in the full ride and experience of what's being what's being created. Yeah, these extension of fan experiences from when you're at concerts and they can track you at a concert now, if you have an NFT, that's your ticket. Like, I think that'll be so interesting as we see how just fan experiences are augmented from conception to to end with these, which is a little bit separate from, I think, this very sexy concept that we're all excited by, by, which is if you identify an artist early, you can invest in their career and then share in their royalties and upside for the years to come. My understanding is the system is is sort of broken in a way that right now, certainly for any mainstream artist who currently has a record deal, that's not really a, a realistic future for like, you're not going to make a bunch of money buying into that artist royalty stream early because of the way that the the system is set up. Is that right? That's correct. I think there's an extreme amount of value in giving fans ownership. So just the concept of ownership, I think, has value. And if we talk about a premium that we can place on collectible assets, the notion of having ownership is valuable, even if the payouts aren't very valuable themselves. But to your point, I think the reason those are not currently super valuable right now is because Spotify is just not a very lucrative system for the vast majority of artists. And um, I think it's more important to instead focus on the on-chain native sales that are happening. So rather than being able to get Spotify streams, I'm really excited about the idea of being able to get 
secondary sales. So if I buy a record on the primary market, I mint it on Sound XYZ, and then I'm able to either resell it later down the line, or better yet, I'm able to stake it and get a percentage of all secondary sales for that record. I think that things start to get really exciting. And to your question earlier about the current structure, uh, I'll just finish this point really fast. Eventually, all the streaming will happen on chain. And so if I own a collectible version of a song, there's no reason if that song's not streaming on Audius and getting payouts on there that I should be able to get a percentage of that natively because I hold the NFT. I think eventually the NFT will become sort of the master and it'll replace sort of this system of like master rights, publishing, et cetera. And it'll all live in one tokenized version of the song. And that'll be the hub that's collecting everything that's natively happening around it. I'm going to describe to you what I think the music industry right now looks like and, and or where some of the big problems are. And most of this I've pulled from your writing and your newsletters and things. And so I've learned this mostly from you, so I should be right. But um, and then and then let's break down where these solves are. But you, you said something in that last answer that I want to just ask about. You said, OK, you, you buy this record that drops and then you stake it and you could get a percentage of future secondary sales Secondary sales of what? The record. So if there's a hundred like the actual CD, or or just if you're staking a record, aren't you hold? What do you mean? <laughs> if to spell it out for me, there's a hundred collectible versions of a record. I own one of them. I stake it. Where is the money coming from? All the secondary sales generate on OpenSea. So there's 99 other records out there. And if one of them sells on the secondary, I collect a royalty from the secondary of that other collectible that just sold on. Se- okay. I didn't know if we were talking like IRL for a second, like, oh, the ma- the record label doesn't have the same claim to like secondary sales of CDs. I glad we got that clarified. Okay. Problems with the music industry, as far as I can tell. <laughs> Royalties take a long time to pay out. You mentioned that. That's super frustrating if you're an artist and you've got to wait months to get a royalty from your streams. Here's the big one. This is this blows my mind. How little money artists are making from streaming. I was seeing numbers I think RAC had put out, but like you'll make like three to four thousand dollars per one million streams on Spotify. Is that correct? That is correct. And that assumes that you own 100 percent of your master, which the vast, vast majority of artists do not have. So that's not even what, because my understanding is, is the reason you're being paid out so little is because the record labels are entitled to 50 to 80% of royalties. Is that right? Yeah. So in that example, there's a million streams, you're getting $4,000. We'll keep it extremely generalized for right now. That's 100% ownership. So if the label owns 50% of that, you're actually only getting $2,000 per every million streams that you get. No, what? I swear this RAC tweet, that's so crazy. This RAC tweet made it sound more like that's okay after you get, I just misinterpreted it. So that's absolutely nuts. So you have a million people who are, who have listened to your song and you're going to make $2,000 off of it. That sounds just so incredibly low to me. Okay. Clearly huge problem. Uh, a lack of data about your fan base. This is something you've written about in your newsletter and, and, and other places like, Spotify really doesn't give you a lot of information about who's listening to your music and you don't have a lot of information about who are your super fans, who like, who would die for your music, who'd pay a thousand dollars for your music. More you want to say about data in this space? I would say broadly, it's less about trying to create new systems that fairly value all music consumption. So trying to like up the rate per stream or anything like that, I think is going to be extremely difficult. In fact, I actually think that all streaming will be free if we zoom out over a long enough time horizon. But I think for those top 1% of super fans, us having better channels to recognize who they are, contact them, and have deeper artist to fan relationships. If I'm someone who's listening to your music um, a thousand times a month and I only listen to your music, my Spotify subscription is not only going to you. It's being broken up pro rata amongst all streams on the platform. So instead, I think a better way of thinking about this is if, if I'm someone who's only listening to your music, how can we get better systems where you're paying more per stream and or you're only giving that income directly to the artist itself rather than trying to create a system that's equitable across everyone with the same per stream rate across every song on the planet, which I think is a very, it makes sense. I understand why we're there right now, but I think there's areas to improve on top of that and make sure we're really honing in on those super fan relationships. So this is a really interesting point. And I think what you're doing is you're connecting these two flaws, right? The lack of data with the the um, the low streaming monetization, the fact that you don't make much money off of streaming. You're saying streaming is getting commoditized. And I think I've heard the Audius CEO make this point that basically the cost per stream is going to go to zero. Can you explain that? Why is that? Why is the cost per stream 
going to zero. Spotify is not profitable, and it's the biggest company for music streaming in the world. Streaming represents 85% of all music industry revenue right now, but it's not a profitable company. And the reason that happens is because they had to buy catalog rights from all the major labels in the world to be able to even put it on in the first place. And so there's basically an incumbent system here that's people boxing out other people to capture the lion's shares of profit. And so the labels are making money. The labels are printing. They're doing fantastic. But the artists are not printing. It's only the people who own their masters that are doing well itself. And so I think rather than trying to create a system where we can say, hey, how do we pay more per stream? which means we have to appease all these major labels and give them more money. It's almost like you have to go back to the core and just say, okay, people are paying $9.99 a month to listen to all the music in the world. What if that's just $0 and you're just paying every time that you consume a song or every time that you want to subscribe to a different artist? And if we try and restructure the way that works, I think that all music will eventually be able to be listened to for free. It's how it is now. I don't have to pay money to go on, go on YouTube and listen to it, but I pay for convenience and I pay for the fact that it's all right in front of me. So we can listen to songs right now for free, we just choose not to because we want to pay for convenience. And so I think if we look at that, there's a world in which all this music just exists natively for free in a convenient way. If we think of open public protocols, you know, the same way that we do in Web3, I don't see any reason why over a long enough time horizon, all these songs will be available just to go and listen to. And if you really want to quote unquote monetize it, um, I use this saying free to listen, valuable to own. And so you can go and stream a song for free all you want. But if you want to really give back to the artist, you can collect a version of that song. And I think that collectible market is exactly the change that's going to allow us to go from fixing a global streaming problem to instead having this balanced system where streaming doesn't have to be the main way that all these artists are getting paid. And this connects to the micropayment you, you said got you started on this journey, which is, you know, the, the reason that click per article journalism hasn't ever taken off is because it doesn't make sense, you know, like it doesn't make sense to pay for one article and pay a few cents because that kind of micropayment, the credit card companies would take a bigger chunk out of that than would make sense to even uh, transact that way. You're saying the same thing with songs. Okay. Suddenly it now might make sense to make micropayments for listening to one song because in a crypto world on a layer two on Solana, which is I know where Audius plays, like you can do that gas free for very cheap. So that's one component of this. And then the super fan piece, the other way you're saying artists should be able to monetize more is on their super fans, which makes total sense. I listen to probably, well, I probably listen to more than like 10 artists on Spotify, but I mostly listen to Taylor Swift <laughs> and she should get <laughs> most of, of my Spotify subscription payments. Um, okay, let's talk about this, this monetization of super fans. And maybe this gets us into Audius a little bit and, and how the Audius payment model works. My understanding is artists who are on Audius can determine how they want to monetize their work and how they want to get paid. Maybe give a, a little bit of a breakdown of what Audius is and then, and then talk about how they're allowing artists to set their own monetization rates. Absolutely. So Audius is an on-chain streaming protocol. The way that I would think of this is SoundCloud, except if it lived natively in Web3. And so there was an entire generation of artists on SoundCloud who made their career off the back of uploading free music, getting that discovered by labels, it going viral, and them going to play world tours. There was never an opportunity for those artists to earn equity in SoundCloud. Instead, all they got was a little bit of marketing exposure and the opportunity to make a career for themselves. And so Audius is the same exact thing as SoundCloud, except all of this content is living natively on chain. And there is a token called Audio, which represents governance over the platform. And so just in the same way that we recognize all these Web3 protocols for having an ownership economy thesis, um, being able to create a music platform where the artists can truly own the platform that they create value for is really, really fascinating. I'll highlight that today on Audius, there's not a pay per stream rate. People aren't making US dollars for streaming. It's actually just a way to build deeper fan relationships within Web3. And so you can come and sign up with an email and a password. You can show off your NFTs on the page. You can earn some audio tokens if you stream at the top of the charts or if you refer people to the platform. But this sort of wider system around on-chain attribution and paid per stream is a huge, huge endeavor. It's not one that currently exists yet. But the thesis is if I'm an artist and I want to set a streaming rate of a dollar per track, I can do that for one single. And if I want to make my other single free, I can make that free. If I want to make it so that someone needs to hold 100 audio tokens to come and access a certain song, I can set up a token gated community. If I want to make it so that an artist needs to hold um, one of my NFTs to be able to access my content, I can do that too. And so Audius is kind of this ecosystem and this hub to connect all these different pieces within, you know, Web3 creator economy monetization and create deeper artist to fan relationships with people that are consuming music every day. So right now, what you just described, hey, you have to hold my NFT to come listen to my songs. Hey, you need to have 100 audio audience tokens to come listen to my song. That, that's in place right now. What's not in place is just like, hey, you can pay me two cents per stream of my song and fiat. Is that the, the, the breakdown of how it currently works? 
there's different tiers on Audius where you can hold tokens, access different things. It's not quite happening on like an artist by artist basis right now. I would say what currently exists today is earning audio tokens for being a value added contributor to the network in the same way that incentives exist for a lot of other Web3 platforms that we know today. And so if you, if I'm an artist who's put my work up on Audius and it's doing really well, I get, I get paid out audio tokens. Is it, it audio is the token, correct? That's correct. You get paid out audio tokens for being one of those top performing streamers and adding to the network in that way. And that audio token has governance control over the overall protocol, the future of Audius, and also, like many of these, gets traded on a decentralized exchanges where it can be converted into other cryptos or fiat and ultimately. Yep. The one thing I want to highlight there is it's not like every time you get a stream on the platform, you're earning audio tokens yet. I think that that's a really big endeavor. It's basically saying, hey, if you're one of the top five performing tracks on a given week, or if you're one of the top five performing playlists, there's a fixed incentive that goes to those users. I think if we zoom out over a long enough time horizon, absolutely. There's going to be a system in place where if you're just streaming really well, you're going to earn tokens on a recurring basis. But as it exists today, I would say fixed incentive over a fixed epoch relative to your performance on the platform as a whole. One thing that's struck me in listening to conversations with some of the audience co-founders is they really seem to be trying to appeal to a mainstream audience, not just a crypto audience. I think they, they said something around the lines like we'd rather be a small fish in the big pond of like music streaming than a big fish in the smaller pond of the crypto ecosystem. So, you know, the the, the crypto piece of audience is actually very behind the scenes. You can go and interact with Audius as a, as a music streaming platform without interacting with crypto or necessarily even realizing that crypto is under the hood. So it feels like they're, they're making a really intentional effort that way. Given that, it is the goal that down the line, there's also fiat transactions that are possible on here where it is, or, or stable coins, where there, there's sort of micro payments per song in a more normy accessible way. Absolutely. I think there's a very real world where you're paying um, a fraction of a cent to listen to a song, but you're not having to swipe your credit card to pay a fraction of a cent. You just have an internal balance on Audius. And every time you stream a track, you're opting into making sure you can make that payment, but it's just coming automatically out of your account. The one thing I want to highlight and zoom in on there is this sort of mainstream adoption versus like deep web three culture. Cause I think it's a really important point that I've had a lot of thought on and have like, you know, developed somewhat of a thesis around. I think right now, a lot of companies are looking for ways to bring crypto mainstream, but in a lot of ways, I don't think that crypto is ready for mainstream. And so a lot of my time has been is instead of trying to onboard, you know, the Post Malone's and Justin Bieber's and all this stuff to NFTs, which frankly, I just don't think we're ready to support yet. I think it's a lot more about creating the next Post Malone or the next Justin Bieber through Web3 natively. And so there's not one size fits all model. And there's a lot of platforms that are operating on both sides of the spectrum. I'm currently leaning more towards independent artists and artists that are natively born in the space. But that's not to say that there isn't a parallel track of people bringing all these celebrities into the market, which is also an extremely valuable, you know, sandbox in and of itself. Well, and it's not just about crypto not being ready for the mainstream, which I makes sense. And of course, we see in a whole bunch of ways. But it's also the music industry not being ready for crypto in what I was describing earlier and, and really making this point to folks, which is that record labels have all the power here. And these artists sign early with these labels before they've gotten big. And so they sign away the rights to their masters, the rights to their work in exchange for some lump sum upfront fee that looks like a ton of money to some young artist who's trying to survive as an artist, but now they don't have the rights to their masters. And so all of the money is flowing to record labels. And so in this grand vision and where I think this can really come together for folks is when you as a fan have real ownership over an artist's future career and have ownership over some royalty streams. And those royalty streams are actually meaningful because the artist owns owns those masters as opposed to owning like a tiny fraction of them or, or themselves getting a tiny fraction of the royalty. So a Justin Bieber who has, you know, it, who's very plugged into the archaic traditional system, it, you're going to be limited in what you can do with them in a Web3 world. Is that right? It, it, more to say on that to, to really explain this to folks, because I think people do not understand how this industry works. Yeah, it's exactly right. And I think that's exactly why you see Justin Bieber collecting in between her PFP projects instead of putting his music natively on chain. You know, I don't think that there's a correct way for musicians of high caliber to get involved with Web3. And so a lot of what I'm looking to figure out is how do we run these playbooks with smaller independent artists that we can take that to a label and say, hey, here's a system that's generating additional revenue for you. It's not cross, you know, it's not taking away from the streams that you're having. But if you're willing to embrace this, I think there's a really cool system for other people to get involved. It's going to be a difficult conversation, but it's one that I think people are starting to have more and more every day. Are younger artists increasingly aware of the bad deal they're being dealt with record labels? I think of like Taylor Swift being very vocal about the fact, God, I mentioned her four times in this podcast, being very vocal about the fact that 
she doesn't own her master's and she's devastated by it. And she wish she didn't sign the deal she did when she was younger. Is this something that people are starting to wise up to if you're a young artist? 100%. And I want to really give color to that last example you gave because it was extremely accurate. So what we see today is an artist who's 18 year old, um, put a song on TikTok. It goes off for 100 million streams. A label comes to them and says, hey, we love your music. What we're going to do is we're going to give you a million dollars up front. We're going to make sure that we're recouping against all that million dollars. And then after that, you're going to get 20% of the streaming rights from your song for the rest of your life, essentially. And so as an artist, I'm getting a million dollars up front. And I'm like, wow, this is incredible. I just made a million dollars. But you're not making a million dollars. You have a loan of a million dollars that you need to pay back. And even after you pay back that loan, you still don't own the thing that you were loaning out in the first place. And so I think what artists are starting to recognize now is saying, hey, I don't have to take a million dollar loan up front. I can actually make a million dollars myself without having to give that away. And instead of having to take a loan from a bank, which is essentially a label, if you do want to crowdfund and actually take on some capital to be able to make a music video, hire producers, live, do the things that artists need to be able to create, you can do that from a smaller demographic of people, namely those super fans that we mentioned before, without having to give away crazy amounts of your ownership. That's not to say that you should never give away your ownership, because I think there is value in bringing people to the table because of that. But I think that we can be a lot more creative in how that ownership is being distributed. And in the event that we challenge the model of how it's being given away, you can start to have people associated with your projects that care more about it on a day-to-day -day basis. I think the incentives can be much greater. So instead of me just going and streaming a track, I can now actually own either a percentage of masters or a collectible version of a song that makes me feel a lot more engaged and motivated to go and spread the likeness of this record. What do you think the future is for record labels? They've got a long, they'll, they'll be around for a while because they've got all these huge acts that are tied to them for the rest of their lives. But as more artists wise up to this, where do you think it goes? I think that record labels start to resemble venture capitalists. And I think instead of them being able to take on deals where they are able to recoup against their loan and then also have ownership in it, I think they're going to have to compete like people like myself with other people that are in venture capital to have to partner with these artists where the artist is now the CEO of a company and the major label is slotting into that rather than the artist being a client of the major label. And in the event that that client relationship is not being prioritized, the artist just gets dropped and there's no, no business with it whatsoever. Yeah, it's you hear this with startup founders and especially in bull markets, which of course we're not in now, but where you can be a lot more selective about like what VC you want on your cap table and think about like what are they bringing to the table beyond just the money or beyond this. And, and it forces you know the VCs to be much more competitive. I think what I hear you describing is just a scenario where record labels have to be much more competitive and they no longer, it's no longer taken for granted that they need you. And so you really have to make the deal fairer for the artists themselves. So one of the bigger problems with music right now is that all of the pockets of music that exist around an artist are very segmented. And so artists will sign to a major label for their master rights, which is the money that they're making from Spotify. They'll sign to a publishing company for their publishing, which is traditionally like when I get a commercial on Apple or something like that. Um, many times they will have touring, which is a different income stream that may have fees going to a tour manager or a tour, um, a booking agent. But all of these things kind of operate in these different silos. And so I think what I'm trying to figure out is how do we sort of put those all together in an umbrella that makes sense. So when we are investing in artists natively, instead of investing in their masters, their publishing, their touring, their merchandise, whatever it might be, all of that should be housed under one roof. And I think the new form of funding an artist is not going to be only buying their masters, it's going to be investing natively in that artist's equity. And that artist's equity should theoretically have a claim on all the different pieces that exist in their wider ecosystem. Does this touch on what you see as these emerging Web3 record labels where you, d does that connect up to this point you're trying to make about it all housed under one entity or is that something separate? Uh, ambitiously, yes. I would say today what most major, um, what most Web3 labels are doing are basically helping artists distribute their music in Web3. And so if they're selling collectible records on catalog or on sound, that Web3 label partner will take a percentage of primary and secondary sales. I think over time, it becomes, you know, very synonymous with what I just mentioned, where they have ownership over everything. But, you know, right now, when I think of a Web3 label, I basically think of a team that is helping someone sell more records on chain. So right now, these Web3 labels are helping artists. They're like consultants who are helping artists speak Web3 and get them in front of a Web3 audience and understand how to like go to market with an NFT collectible. Is that what I hear you saying? That's exactly right. For many of these artists that are natively in Web3, they're actually releasing their music on chain before they're putting it on Spotify. And in many case scenarios, they're making way more money from selling collectibles than they are from streaming. And so the Web3 label's role is basically to do tokenomics, to do partnerships, to do governance, community management, treasury management, all the things that we see with Web3 companies and DAOs, except now it's just happening for an artist project. 
And so we're even starting to see the rise of what I call meta stars, which are acts that live natively in the metaverse. They're not on Spotify. Um, they're not humans. They're often like avatars, like a fluff world character or like a board ape. And these Web3 labels are basically creating the lore and the narrative for them. They're creating this digital brand around the artist. They're producing the music on the back end and then distributing it in the form of NFTs to develop super fan relationships that all exist natively in Web3 as the home base. So Kingship, would that be a good example of what you're describing with these these meta stars? Yep. Kingship's a great example of that. Uh, I'm a really big fan of Angel Baby, which is a project by Hume, which is a Web3 record label. I've been helping out a lot with a project called Roki, which is a Web3 native artist project. Um, the Board Brothers, which is a collab between Ryan Tedder from One Republic and Kygo, both using their board apes to output some music has been really fascinating. There's a bunch of others that I could mention, but there's definitely this like bubbling wave of Web3 native artist projects. And as far as where I've been spending my time from the quote unquote management front, it's been figuring out how to break and act natively through Web3. Do you think we will hit a point where meta stars are as big as IRL stars? Without a doubt. Ah, it, this is where I'm like, I feel like a boomer. Like, I, I just can't wrap my head around caring as much about a, a board ape act as I do about a, a real human act. And it, to me, it always maintains a little bit of a fringe status, but I'm sure I'm probably wrong about that. I don't think you're wrong about it in its current form. I think that board apes making music is definitely cringe. I will totally co-sign that. <laughs> but I think it gets to a point where um, we have the Daft Punks, the Gorillas, the Marshmallows of the world, all these major acts who are not their individual human identities, but rather their artist project. That same concept that exists natively online, there is no reason why an artist shouldn't be able to play five shows at the same time all around the world. There's no reason why we shouldn't be able to have a million people coming to a concert at the same time a million people in a discord, you know, there are limitations to the physical space that have value. And I think exclusivity is a really good thing. But if we try and think of ways to expand the total addressable market for music and fan communities, we need more online interactive spaces. And I think that's the exact area that Metastars are going to thrive. That in many ways, I think a lot of artists today are not well suited to do because they just don't care as much about exploring these new digital frontiers that we're also passionate about here in Web3. Living a bankless life requires taking control over your own private keys. And that's why so many in the Bankless Nation already have their Ledger hardware wallet. And brand new to the Ledger lineup of hardware wallets is the Ledger Nano S Plus, a huge upgrade to the world's most popular hardware wallet. With more memory and a larger screen, the Nano S Plus makes it easy to navigate and verify your transactions. And the paired Ledger Live desktop app gives you increased transparency as to what is about to happen with your NFT. What you see is what you sign. The Nano S Plus gives you the smoothest possible user experience while you're doing all of your crypto things. So go to the Ledger website to check out the features of the new Ledger Nano S Plus and join the waitlist to get yours. And don't forget about the Crypto Life card, also powered by Ledger. The CL card is a crypto debit card that hooks right into the Ledger Live app, right next to all the DeFi apps and services that you're already used to doing, like swapping tokens and staking. So if you don't have a Ledger hardware wallet, go to ledger.com, grab a Ledger, and take control over your crypto. Rarible is the NFT platform that's leading the charge into the multi-chain universe ahead of us. Available on Flow, Tezos, Polygon, and of course, Ethereum, Rarible is the perfect place for NFT newcomers, profile picture collectors, and experienced NFT traders. Rarible has a variety of NFT features that set it apart from other NFT marketplaces. They have a native messaging function allowing you to DM your friends or haggle with sellers. They also have a mobile app on iOS and Android with a built-in NFT portfolio tracker tool so you can easily check the value of your digital art portfolio. Rarible is built on the Rarible protocol, a multi-purpose, open source, and community-governed NFT protocol that helps build products and services across the NFT ecosystem, including white label marketplaces tailored to specific NFT communities. So go to rarible.com and start discovering and trading NFTs, putting in floor bids to join PFP communities, and DM with some brand new internet friends. You, you threw out some numbers there, and, and it, one thing that I think is so striking is how big, at least reportedly, Audius's user basis. I've seen numbers like 6 million active users. Is that accurate, up to date? What are we looking at numbers wise for Audius? Yeah, it's extremely accurate and it's extremely up to date. I think that there was a ceiling that was hit with sort of the current user base on Audius, and there's going to need to be like a leg up to get that to keep growing. Um, I'll be honest with you, I'm actually way less concerned with like how many average fans are using Web3 right now and more so about how many fans are collecting music NFTs. Because I think that number is a lot smaller. I'd say that number is probably closer to like 2,500 to 5,000 people in the world. But that small number, I think, is a lot more telling of where the space currently is rather than how many people are using a streaming app. And I will co-sign Audius forever. I think they're incredible and I have nothing but love for them. But I think the number I'm trying to figure out is like, how do we get more people to recognize that collecting 
a record for five, 10, $100 has value? And how do we deepen these artist to fan relationships with smaller pockets? Because I think that's the thing that's going to capture the lion's share of value here. And the thing that's really going to move the needle for the space as a whole. Is it a social media play, right? Is it, is it how do we get people to be able to signal better that they're a super fan of an artist by showing off their music collectible in a better way than we currently have? Absolutely. I think it's three things. I think it's visibility. So being able to show off your records. I think it's access, being able to come in and talk to the artist or talk to fans of that artist. And then I think it's profit, being able to make money off of the art that you're collecting. I think the third piece around profit is actually the biggest reason why music NFTs have not quite scaled yet is because most people aren't making money from trading them. And for better or worse, most people are buying NFTs because they want to make money. And if they're not making money, they're not excited. So I think we kind of need to find the right middle ground where people are able to show off their music NFTs. They're able to come into fan communities that are actually engaging and exciting to them. And most importantly, they're able to see a little bit of money. If I'm early to a song and I buy it before it drops and then it goes on to stream 100 million streams on Spotify, theoretically, that record should be performing super well in the secondary market on OpenSea. But I just don't think we have enough experiments yet to test out whether or not that thesis is true. I mean, I see analogs to this in, in again, what I'd call visual NFT world which is where I obviously spend a bit more time when I think about a project like uh, Aku and Aku Tars, where this is a team who's very clear they're making a, a movie and they have ex Lucasfilm people working on the story and, and creating this film. And I feel very bullish on their ability to create a really amazing film and maybe one of the first projects to do so and reach a mainstream audience with TV. And I have no idea what that's going to mean for the price of the NFT, <laughs> right? Like in theory, it should mean the NFT goes up in value, but that's really untested because we haven't seen that happen yet. Is that what you're saying? Like you could own this record and it becomes one of those popular albums, but will that mean anything for the NFT? That's exactly what I'm saying. And I think that this is the next chapter for Web3 as a whole is tokenized media. I think so far when we consume post music, whatever it might be, we don't have a way to capture the upside of the performance of that on social media. And I think that Web3 is really just a value capture mechanic where if any of these assets are performing well, a song, a YouTube video, a podcast, a blog post, a tweet, whatever it might be, us being able to collect that adds these new incentives around sharing and virality that I think is going to be extremely important for curation and be the exact reason why we're going to see such an exponential leg up in the market over the next three to five years. I want to get technical for a minute. It, it, we talked about the the six million active users on Audius. They moved last year over to Solana. They were initially built on Ethereum, really couldn't scale effectively on Ethereum, moved to Solana. I don't know if still in the process of moving components of the ecosystem onto Solana. Why Solana versus a layer two? If you can speak to that, I don't know. Layer twos were not in a good position to support what Audius was doing at the time. Um, at the time of the migration, Audius was on POA network and it was currently taking up 97% of the active bandwidth of that network on any given day. And so it was really just a bandwidth constraint thing. It was like what network can handle all of the transactions that we're processing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I don't think it was really as much of like a this team versus that team decision. It was just like what's up, functional and stable today. And at that point in time, mind you, this was a year and a half ago, Solana was basically one of the only places to go ahead and make that migration in the first place. And for what it's worth, I think that it was an extremely smart choice because there's a very vibrant NFT ecosystem on Solana now. You know, there's a, an ongoing variety of tools that are being developed and a wider ecosystem that's being created there. So I think it was a really smart choice. You know, the token still lives natively on Ethereum and all of the on-chain governance and staking lives natively on Ethereum. But when you go to Audius, the platform, and you press play, behind the scenes, what's happening is a request to Solana. And I think that that was fundamentally necessary to allow this platform to scale to the amount that it wants to. I want to do some history talk here. You mentioned SoundCloud earlier and that being an analog for Audius. Again, I don't come from the indie music world. I, I've never really played in that scene. But in doing research here, what I what I learned was that SoundCloud really had this dramatic fall from grace where it was this place that new artists could go and upload their work and an algorithm would help them get discovered by people who like, you know, alternative music. And then they could build a fan base and go make money on concerts because they weren't making money on the streams on SoundCloud, but they could have concerts and sell merch and they had a bigger fan base because of that. And that at some point that basically just like fell off a cliff and the traffic died and SoundCloud stopped being a platform. What's the story there? Why did that happen? What are the learnings for Audius perhaps? So everything you said was accurate there. The one thing that I would color a little bit more is it wasn't the algorithm that was making a song go viral. It was the curation of the platform itself. And so there's this huge blog culture around SoundCloud where a song would get shared by a blogger. That blog would go on a site called Hype Machine and people would upvote tracks to basically push it to the top of the list. 
if you had a number one song on Hype Machine on SoundCloud, it was going to do numbers because that was seen as kind of like the cream of the crop charts. And so there's this whole system around curation and reposting. And what ended up happening is people started to make collectives where they would be releasing music together. There would be like five or six artists that were all sharing it. It increased the likelihood of getting put on a blog. And then these stories kind of started to happen where there was larger narratives around the music than the song itself. Where things started to go wrong is people started to commoditize reposting. And so they would say, if you pay me $20, I'm going to repost this song on an account that has 100,000 followers. And that primitive got multiplied where there were then repost chains where you could pay $1,000 to have your song reposted to 10 million followers. That was all just accounts reposting song without any real endorsement. And so the average everyday meaning of a repost got completely diminished where people stop caring about reposts. There's no significance to it. Whereas at one point in time, if you got a repost from Skrillex or Flume or Diplo or whoever it might be, that was fucking money. You know, like you were going up on Hype Machine, like it was a really big deal. People were talking about it on Twitter and Instagram. But once that started to lose its touch and people were just paying to play, essentially, the specialty and the novelty of that went away. SoundCloud basically did a huge fundraise from a major label. They started policing mixes a lot more. They started policing remixes a lot more. And so a lot of that early collaborative discovery nature that existed in the early days of SoundCloud got replaced by this desire to monetize. And so you had to pay $15 a month to have all your catalog on the platform. Um, you were getting takedowns very easily. You were kind of having these songs that you couldn't stream for free. You had to have a certain type of membership. And so all of these guardrails ended up becoming a way to kind of segment culture. And I think once culture left the room, so did all of the money that was being created with it. Damn, that's fascinating. It, it, what it gets to too is this, the importance of curators, which I know is something you feel really strongly about. You've really been a curator throughout your career and love of music. Where do, what does the role curators play in this new Web3 ecosystem of music and monetization? I think it is the biggest opportunity for anyone who's a fan of music today. You know, the reason I buy so many music NFTs is not because I think I'm going to make a lot of money. It's because of the curation aspect of it. I think for the first time in history, you as a fan of music can have a career just by liking good music, which is something crazy to say. But historically, that has not been the case. If you like good music and you're really good at finding it, you could go be an A&R at a major label. You could go be a curator at Spotify and make a proprietary playlist for the company. But there's not really been ways for you to stand alone and operate as an independent curator. And so for Web3, I think that curators are going to be the single most important way that we drive secondary sales to these artist economies in the same way that you see curators, quote unquote, like Dees or Keyboard Monkey or Zeneca or, you know, 50 other names that I could mention. The exact same thing is going to happen in music. I think that these people are going to be the ones that are really moving markets in a really meaningful way. And I think as someone that's able to capture the culture in a very pure way and start to output that through your creation of what you're buying. I think there's an entire career opportunity to be made on the back of the curation that you're doing every single day. Where do you show off your curations? Is it just OpenSea? Right now it's OpenSea. I mean, SoundXYZ has a really good page to show off their records. Catalog has a profile page. I'll be honest with you, the curation and the visibility of music is pretty bad right now. There's actually not really a good place to show that off. There's a lot of team working on it, but I think one of the major unlocks for music NFTs is going to be the social experience around it. And so something that I'm really excited about is if I go and I see a Halsey record streaming on Spotify. There's this canvas cover art behind it that's this cool visual layer. I wanna be able to press a button and collect that and then have a social graph that I can go and show my friends, hey, not only do I like this song, but I actually spent $5 collecting it because I really like it. And if I'm someone that asks me like, what kind of music do you like? I just send them my collection and they can see what songs I really resonate with as by virtue of the different music NFTs that I've collected. Spotify's suggested that they're, they're gonna start playing with NFTs. Are you tracking this? Are you excited about this? Is it meaningful or it's nothing at this stage? I would say every major social company in the world has suggested that they're playing around with Web3 by virtue of it being a necessity. But I'm a lot more excited to see who actually ships something of value so that we can talk about what they're practically doing instead of the implication of them doing it. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, who do you think is the next wave of adopters here? You mentioned some pretty small numbers, 2,500 to 5,000 people who are actually collecting music NFTs in any sort of meaningful way. What's the next wave? The next wave is a combination of NFT buyers. So people that are buying board Apes, people that are buying art blocks, and it's a combination of average everyday super fans. So someone who's really, really passionate about an artist, but has never bought an NFT before. I think the vertical in the middle there is basically convincing someone who YOLOs on PFPs every day that they should give music NFTs a shot paired with someone who's never bought an NFT in their life, but really loves an artist that it might be worth it for them to buy a music NFT for 0.05 ETH as their first record and their first way of coming into the ecosystem. I feel like we have to mention the chain smokers who are a huge act. Have you been working with them to, to bring them onto Web3? 
I've not been working with them personally. I mean, they're good friends of mine. Um, they have a venture firm called Mantis, which they've been doing amazing investing in the space for quite a long time now. Um, they recently did a drop on Royal, which I know that you're alluding to, which is fantastic. So they put out a new album and they basically gave away music NFTs representing 1% ownership in the album for free. And so if you were a VIP fan who was someone who had listened to their music, you'd bought tickets to their show or merchandise, you got whitelisted to come and claim one of these early records. And you could basically collect a version of the album that represented a 1% claim on all of the royalties from all of the streaming on Spotify. And again, realistically, that's not going to be that much money, which is why I think it's great they did it for free because I was looking at some of these numbers. I mean, they do 34 million, I think, monthly streams or something as as a band. But realistically, that doesn't amount to 1% of whatever they get doesn't amount to all that much especially divided among the 1900 people who get to hold these initial NFTs. Is that right? That's correct. The thing I really liked about it is one that they did, they did something, you know, which is something that a lot of artists aren't doing right now. They're just being out there and being experimental. They gave it away for free, where it's very clear that this was not a profit generating opportunity for them. They showed provenance and consistency by saying, hey, we care about this space. We don't quite think it's at a space where all of our fans can participate, but we're going to do something very light just to get started. And so when I look to collect music NFTs moving forward, the biggest thing that I look for is consistency. You know, it's not necessarily like how much do I think that this song is going to go up? You know, how much do I think that this artist is going to appreciate in value? It's just like, is this artist coming back time and time again? Are they showing up to different spaces? Are they supporting the ecosystem as a whole? Are they doing things that's moving the needle forward? And if I'm seeing that they're coming back time and time again, I get really excited about that because I'm actually far more excited about someone who's tokenized five different records over the course of three months, more so than I am about someone who has 50 million monthly listeners dropping one NFT one time and then never being seen again. Mm -hmm. cash grab versus somebody who's really in it to build the space and, and benefit the ecosystem as a whole. Yeah. I want to give some clarity on that because I don't think that anyone is intentionally cash grabbing. You know, like I've sat with so many different artist teams at this point that want to do things in web three. And mm -hmm. that word always comes up. They say, we want to get in the space really authentically. We don't want this to come across as a mm -hmm. cash grab. No one goes into it being like, yo, I'm going to make $10 million. <laughs> I'm going to be out. Like, what do you think? You on board? So I think that people are not misguided in terms of their intent. I think that they just get really lost because they do a drop and they see that people just aren't supporting it or the drop doesn't do as well as they wanted. And then they get scared and never want to come back. And so I think the role that I've been playing for a lot of artists is really just around like level setting and expectations and being like, hey, people don't care about you in Web3. I know you have 10 million followers on Instagram and I know you have 10 million monthly listeners, but people do not care about collecting your NFTs. You need to really start from the ground up and show that you can sell 25, 100, 1,000 before you can try and sell 10,000 and make $10 million. And the reason why people are getting disenfranchised is because they are just shooting for the stars. They're selling something to people that they don't know what they want to do with or have any expectation of doing in the future. And so people are left holding the bag because these ideas were very half baked. And so I think to the Chainsmokers example, giving it away for free, doing it on a platform like Royal, which is doing a really fantastic job, doing it with their new record, those are all things that I love. And I think moving forward when they do their next NFT, People are going to come back and say, hey, I remember that record you gave away for free. I think that was a really cool idea. And someone like myself is going to be more willing to purchase something because of the fact that they saw they had brand awareness and consistency. And I think that's the exact metric that I look for as I'm collecting any artist in the space at large. Does your advice to, to new artists or to artists you're trying to get in vary depending on the genre of music they're in? Like it would feel like alternative music would play better here than like your straight pop, but I don't really know. No, because I look at the relationship the artist has with their fan, not necessarily the type of music that they're making. And so I think that different fan communities resonate more deeply with specific types of music. So, for example, I think that electronic music communities are a little bit more diehard than um, let's call it like a pop, a pop act for a lot of hey, ways. But I don't, I don't know. Think watch that out. That... Watch out. <laughs> yeah, it's not across the board. Get into my territory. Fans, you know, they're pretty, pretty serious out here. Yeah. But what I will say is that... Um, for artists that are looking to get into Web3, I ask them, like, how in touch are you with your fans? And then I say within that fan base, how in touch with you are your super fans? And if we zoom into that, I think that's the demographic that I look to try and build for. Not necessarily how do we get everyone in the world to collect one of these records, but for that 1% of people that have been following you for 10 years, what would they want? And what's something that would get them over the line? And if we can design a system or a process around that, I think that's the way that they can have a sandbox to experiment with that feels very safe and guarded and knows it has strong support. I think over time, you then branch that out and bubble it up until it eventually gets to their whole fan base. But it really starts with just one super fan at a time. 
think that's such a, a good point and it's important to, to emphasize. We've, we talked about super fans a little bit earlier, but really emphasizing that to people that we're, we're in this creator economy shift that you and I have talked about. It's a legion phrase, which is like, it's not just about a thousand true fans anymore. It's, it's really can be about a hundred true fans and that NFTs and, and web three are unlocking this ability to monetize and, and really be supported as a creator with just a hundred people who absolutely love your work. And that's so exciting. And for people who are maybe afraid to jump in, like let that be something that encourages you, right? Is, is that's a, that's a bite-sized chunk to take on. Hey, let me just focus on getting a hundred super fans. That's exactly right. And it really challenges you to think about the relationship with all those individual collectors. Selling 25 music NFTs right now is extremely difficult. You can have 5 million monthly listeners, but trying to get 25 people to buy one of your NFTs is not an easy feat. And so I personally really loved the shift in mentality where people are having to work really hard just to get every single little sale. I think this is why we're going to start to see artists really break out in the next two years over Web3 is because they're going to have this sort of thick skin that comes from getting 25 people individually to buy a record. And I think if we have a lot more of those experiments, people are going to start to appreciate how hard it is to really succeed in this space. Over time, it's going to be easier. But those people who had to go through the tough times at the beginning, I think you're going to see the people who are reaping the most rewards in the future because they went through this sort of phase of music NFTs where you had to work your ass off to be able to sell 25 records. Is there a, a regulatory piece of this going to, to Royal, which I don't know if we've we've explained Royal yet at this point, but folks are probably familiar. And again, it gives you the right to buy into a project and then own a piece of the masters. The Chainsmokers launched on there. You can own 1% of this new album they're dropping where it, it has a higher likelihood of being classified as a security. Like how is that regulatory landscape looking for music NFTs? I think it's a valid point to be concerned about it. I don't think that it's as big a deal as people make it out to be. I think that for a lot of these projects, they are pushing the needle on what it means to have ownership over different artist projects. You know, honestly, a lot of that falls into the ballpark of maybe being classified as a security. I won't speak to the way that Royal's dealing with that because they have spent far more time with their counsel than I have. What I can say is they're very confident in their stance that this is not a security, and I'm going to go ahead and just let it ride with that. But at the end of the day, I don't think that we should be scared about ownership and be scared about giving rights to our holders because this is what the space needs as a whole far beyond music to move forward and if we exist in this sort of middle ground where we say that every asset is valueless and only has governance rights we are not going to succeed as an industry we need to get to a point in time where we can feel comfortable saying it's okay for you to earn a dividend or it's okay for you to earn some eth if you're a value-added contributor to this ecosystem and so i've been a lot more forward with trying to push forward that narrative saying lean in to the uncertainty around regulation rather than try and put your hands up and run away and wait for guidance, which is never going to come in the first place if we take that path. Yeah, you got, you got to force the guidance to come by diving in and, and doing it well enough that they can't deny you. One distinction I feel like I've heard as I, I've dug into this a little bit is it's one thing if you are, for example, the chain smokers, you have a product that's out and now you're offering like an ownership stake in this existing product versus perhaps saying I'm an artist who's trying to fundraise on in advance of something and say like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm selling this up front for in advance, going to make a piece of work that you're going to have a stake in. There, there seems to be perhaps a regulatory distinction between those two scenarios. Again, very much not being the pro, but something to, to kind of track. You're exactly right. Yeah. So Royal only exists uh, to release records that have already been put out so far. And so Royal's not doing anything that hasn't been released yet. They're only taking records that already exist and giving you ownership over those masters that have already been released and are already streaming today. That, yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, last topic that I want to get into. I think this is a term in, in you used in your newsletter, and you should you should plug that for folks because it's great. And you give a lot of awesome updates about what's happening in the music ecosystem. I, I think it was in one of your newsletters. You talked about creator stock markets and this idea of like betting on artists and their careers. And uh, I want to set this up by saying I'm fascinated by this concept of like the financialization of everything. And I think you hear it oftentimes in like very fearful terms of like, you know, we're going to have another financial crisis because of all these bubbles, because now everything's going to be a financial asset. And I'm skeptical of that doomsday narrative. I think there's actually some really amazing things that are happening. I, I was in Puerto Rico and interviewed a tattoo artist who's selling NFTs where now the only way to get tattooed by him is, is to own one of his NFTs, which is a way to speculate on the future value of a tattoo by this artist, but it's not something like Goldman Sachs is diving into to like inflate into oblivion and then crash the market, right? It's like tattoo fans and it's people who like this particular tattoo artist who are getting in on this. So I think it's really exciting, but I would love to hear you talk about this concept of creator stock markets and how it's playing out in music and, and, um, what excites you or, or scares you perhaps about it. 
I'll start by saying that all artists are businesses, whether they recognize it or not. Mm. I think that we're very far away away from a creator stock market existing in its pure form. But in the same way that we want to purchase $5 worth of Amazon stock, I don't think there's any reason why I can't purchase $5 worth of Jack Harlow. I think that that's a really difficult conversation to wrap your head around, but I think that Web3 is the unlock that makes this a reality. And so we've seen a big wave of social tokens, right? We've seen fan coins like Portugal the Man where you can buy the likeness of this artist. But the biggest reason why I don't think this is stuck with people is there's nothing underpinning it. I think the biggest change with music NFTs is we now have on-chain cash flows that are going back into a community treasury and tokens that represent governance over those, those assets. So if we zoom out far enough, anyone can make a social token. But I think what we're going to see happen is in the same way that only specific companies get listed on the NASDAQ after they prove themselves to be a viable company and a viable business, I think creator stock markets will be social tokens that are sort of curated and listed based on the fact that they have proved on-chain records, on-chain revenue, you know, historical sales, and they have this sort of system underpinning it where this is no longer just a speculative bet on some arbitrary fan coin. You know, these are pure artist ownership in the, the most real sense of the word. And so that's why I've been so passionate about music NFTs. I think it's the underpinning for the existence of artist economies. And I think if we zoom back and we look over a five to 10 year time horizon, there is no reason why you should not be able to buy five to $10 of your favorite artist. And that world is extremely interesting to me and something that I hope to play a very big role in building. So interesting. I, I, I think of all the ramifications of this, which of course you can't think of all the ramifications because I think this is a huge just cultural shift that would be underway. But I, I do worry a little bit about artists' mental health. I, I interviewed Danny Cole and and he even started commenting on, he's like, I feel like I'm at the forefront of this phenomenon that really hasn't happened much in history where like, I feel like the CEO of a public company where what I say impacts the price of an asset that a bunch of people hold. And like, I'm now impacting their livelihoods in some ways. And like, as an artist, I didn't feel like I was signing up for that. Like the CEO of Pepsi knows they have to watch their words. Like I didn't, cold and think about that, um, which is fascinating. But I, I think your point of like, they're already businesses, right? What Danny Cole said mattered before anyway for his artist career. It's just really visible now in a way that it wasn't perhaps before. Yeah. And I think the idea of all artists being the CEO of their own business is extremely scary. I think the more likely scenario is that most artists won't be CEOs of their own artist project. They will be the creative lead, the creative output. You know, they're going to be producing these incredible works. But, you know, in the same way that any team scales in Web3, where you have a very small set of individuals at the beginning that branches out to this wider community, I think the responsibility of that artist can change over time. You know, they're not responsible for hiring or like spending the marketing budget or determining the drop structure of their NFTs. They can go and make incredible art. They can do their thing and talk to the world in the way that they always do. And there can be a sophisticated team underneath them that's supporting this ecosystem. But as a whole, it all comes together by owning this one token that represents ownership in that brand. And I think the more that we challenge that equation, the more exciting it's going to be for curators such as myself. And honestly, the reason why I've spent all my time trying to figure out how it's going to work. Well, thank you so much, Cooper. I mean, we'll, well, Koopa, do you want to go probably called Koopa Troopa or Cooper on this call? You've got Koopa Troopa on your thing. Whatever your, floats your boat. Whatever, whatever works. I, I, I mentioned this to you earlier, but I've like literally just been singing the super trooper sounds is gonna find you ABBA <laughs> song in all of my research for this episode. Um, last question. Do you have a favorite band? My favorite electronic artist is Elenium. My favorite uh, independent artist is Tycho. And my favorite rapper right now is probably Post Malone or Kid Leroy. Amazing. And no, no pop artists. You don't have a favorite pop artist? Really like the new Harry Styles album. I think it's fantastic. All right. Okay. Yeah, you do dabble. I, I was watching a Bankless interview where uh, I think David joked about wanting to be able to short country music. And <laughs> he's really excited for the creator stock markets that he can uh, short country music. So I won't ask you if you have a, a, a favorite country song or a favorite country band. All right, Koopa. Thank you so much for being here. This was a blast. We'll have you back on to track how this ecosystem is evolving. I love it. Thank you for the time. And I look forward to doing one soon. <laughs> much for watching this episode of Overpriced JPEGs. If you liked this conversation, if you liked this episode, please go ahead and hit subscribe. It helps me out. It helps the show out. And it means you will get alerts and updates when we post new content. Thanks again.